very good. We've got so many people attending this event. Um, this is the Crest Advisory webinar on the Out of Court Disposals and Diversion Scheme report, which we have published today and you can read on our website. Uh, it's a major report that we've been working on for about 12 months, looking at the trends in the use of out of court disposals and out of court diversion programs across England and Wales, their effectiveness, and really asking the question and trying to answer the question, is there scope to expand the use of out of court disposals? And if there is scope, how should that expansion be undertaken? What are the sort of principles that need to be in place uh, to use these types of non-court sanctions even more. We're going to go through the main findings of the report in just a minute, but first I just want to briefly introduce our panel to discuss the findings. I'm very pleased that we've been joined by Jason Q, Detective Chief Inspector at Thames Valley Police and uh, an innovator really when it comes to diversion programmes. Penelope Gibbs uh, from the campaign group Transform Justice is also on our panel and so is Peter Nehru, former Chief Constable, uh, now an academic at the University of Cambridge, again someone who has great experience in this area. And our panellists will all be uh, talking for a few minutes um, after we've gone through the report and then joining in the debate. And that's really the important part of this is that we would like you to contribute your thoughts, your questions, your comments um, so we will be opening, well, we have opened the chat line and the Q&A line for you uh, to post your comments and so on. And I'll be going through exactly how, you, how to do that after we've gone through the report. So um, that's a brief sort of introduction. Um, now let's um, go through briefly uh, the findings uh, of our report. Um, we started doing some research um, back in, in 2020 about the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on the criminal justice system across England and Wales. And our main conclusions were that case court, uh, court caseloads could quadruple by 2024, and that there was a desperate need to find better ways to manage offenders at the front end, the front end of the criminal justice system. That was really our top line uh, conclusion. And we know from recent figures that the magistrates courts backlogs, although they've come down a bit, are still over 300,000, I believe. Crown court backlogs where the worst problems are around 60,000. And we've seen Dominic Raab um, introducing measures to raise sentencing powers for magistrates in part to deal with that. So we wanted to identify through this project whether there was scope to expand the use of out of court sanctions and diversion programs partly with the aim of easing pressure on the criminal justice system. And we also looked at ways to improve the effectiveness of these disposals and enhance people's understanding of them. So there were five main strands to our research. We analyzed public data on out-of-court disposals. We researched the use of out-of-court disposals and their effectiveness. We gathered insight from national and local stakeholders, and, and we're very thankful for the time and effort that they gave uh, to our research. We carried out an in-depth study in the Thames Valley Police Force area. And again, many thanks uh, to our friends in Thames Valley uh, for participating. And we consulted the public in a nationally representative survey. And you may have seen uh, some of those survey results reflected in coverage today, particularly in the Telegraph. So let's go on to the uh, findings. We looked first of all at the trends and the proportion of crimes which lead to an outcome such as a charge or caution in England and Wales. Those trends are published regularly by the Home Office and they have both been in long term decline. I think people will be aware that the proportion of cases that result in someone being prosecuted uh, has fallen since around 2015 and the same is true uh, of those uh, cases which result in an out-of-court disposal. But the majority of out-of-court disposals that used are community resolutions. Um, these are non-statutory um, disposals that typically involve um, an offender apologizing, writing a letter of apology, 
some sort of reparation. It's a kind of light touch out of court disposal that does not go on an individual's criminal record. They're used mainly for drugs offences, but in over a quarter of cases, they are issued for crimes of violence against the person. Now, what we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, when we know that court hearings and jury trials in particular were severely curtailed, which added to case backlogs and delays, um, was that out of court disposals were used more. This was partly because I think there was some guidance uh, from, Crown from the Crown Prosecution Service uh, and also police forces perhaps taking a more pragmatic approach rather than knowing that cases were gonna get put off for weeks and months um, some cases were dealt with through out-of-court disposals and community resolutions in particular. So a key question, given the problems caused by the pandemic and the projected increase in demand on the courts, if you've got 20,000 extra police officers uh, by 2023, that is expected to lead to more arrests, more charges, more pressure on the courts. Key question is whether pressures can be relieved by making better use of out-of-court disposals and diversion schemes. The problem that we have come across, and I think other researchers have come across uh, when they've looked at out-of-court disposals, is that it's very hard to make meaningful comparisons um, around reoffending rates with court-imposed sanctions, because the characteristics of the pools of offenders are different. So there have been some attempts to do this, but they are few and far between, and so it's very difficult to say that the reoffending rate, for example, for someone who's cautioned, for people who are cautioned, is better or worse than for people who are given the community sentence imposed by the courts. And that's something that really needs to be addressed through better research. There is some evidence, however, that out-of-court disposals which involve diversion programs are successful in cutting reoffending, reducing harm and keeping costs down. The checkpoint scheme introduced by police in Durham is a good example of this. It's been properly evaluated and a big push is needed to expand the use of these schemes. That scheme can be a model and can be replicated in other forces with proper evaluation, proper monitoring, um, you know, the proper expertise that goes into applying those sorts of schemes, then there's definitely um, a strong argument for expanding that kind of approach. Victims of crime appear to be more satisfied when an offender receives an out-of-court disposal and takes part in a diversion scheme than when there is a prosecution. That may partly be because out-of-court disposals um, can be dealt with, um, are handed out more quickly than obviously going to court. Criminal justice stakeholders that we spoke to generally supported the use of out-of-court disposals, but they had concerns about the evidence base and they called for more rigor in evaluating outcomes for offenders, victims, the criminal justice system, and the public. Next slide. Um, so we believe that innovative approaches which tackle specific problems affecting a local area should be encouraged. Um, so it's absolutely the right thing for police forces, police and crime commissioners, which have local issues or which really believe in a particular approach, they should be encouraged to adopt that, 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 that mode. But there are some wide disparities between neighboring forces in their approach to out of court disposals that are really hard to explain and don't aid public understanding and lead to inconsistencies which are not helpful. We found that out-of-court disposals are issued for a wide spectrum of, of crimes, even though they were really designed to tackle low-level offending, drugs possession to robbery and sexual offences, and that raises concerns about whether the use is always appropriate and if it is being monitored properly. Um, there are some cases where it may be appropriate to issue an out-of-court disposal for a sexual offence on a let's say uh, someone who's under the age of 18 in a particular circumstance, perhaps that person has particular vulnerabilities, that may be the appropriate option. 
but certainly the way they're used and the broad spectrum of offences and the number of out-of-court disposals does raise some questions around that. There's a lack of consensus among the experts that we talk to as to whether certain offences like hate crimes and domestic abuse should be off limits. There were some really sharp differences of opinion there. And there is also, and this was very worrying, um, there's inconsistency and confusion about some very basic issues around adequate disposals, whether suspects must admit guilt or take responsibility for the crime they're suspected of in order to qualify for out of court disposals and diversion schemes. A real worrying um, lack of clarity around that in some official guidance, and that really must be addressed as a matter of urgency. Next one, please. Tailored diversion is our schemes which are, uh, are designed in such a way that they address the particular needs of offenders, tackle the underlying problems which cause the offending, rather than a sort of catch-all approach, a blanket approach. Um, uh, and we believe that the tailored diversion schemes do represent real opportunities for tackling reoffending and promoting rehabilitation. And we've seen some examples of those, but they require upfront investment. Um, and we believe that different ways of funding such programs should be found to create incentives for police forces and police and crime commissioners to provide the necessary resources. Maybe that there's some kind of match funding, central government gives, a, gives some funding if PCCs agree to match it, but certainly there needs to be something upfront to encourage that, that, that approach. We also um, found that there was a lot of merit in the approach taken by youth offending teams in the way that they assess people under the age of 18 to attend diversion schemes tailored to their needs and that that could provide a possible model for adult offenders. It's certainly not, I don't think, a new recommendation that's been made that we need some kind of approach akin to youth offending teams for those aged between 18 to 25. We know that young people's brains are still developing until they're around 25, they're still maturing emotionally and mentally. Um, and yet there's this cliff edge when someone turns 18, they enter the probation system rather than coming under the responsibility of youth offending teams. And that can create lots of problems. So uh, this is a recommendation that Crest has made before, but we believe there needs to be something for young adults similar to youth offending teams. And that would also help when they go on out of court diversion programs. Speed is absolutely vital. Um, there is a moment when someone has committed a crime or when they've accepted responsibility, you know, after the crime has taken place, when engagement that happens quickly and can be most effective. Uh, but we know that there are delays in investigations. We know that there are other delays in consultations with CPS and other partners, and that isn't helpful. Um, and so there must be some incentives to get um, uh, to get these measures um, in place as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Um, one of the aspects that we looked at during the research um, was how clear police forces are about um, what they're doing in regard to article disposals. Um, this wasn't something we intended to look at at the beginning of the project, but it became clear to us that we couldn't get the information about what police forces were actually doing, what out of court disposals they use, how often they use them, what diversion programs they use, what happens if a young person's caught with drugs, are they going to be go to court, are they more likely to be sent on a diversion program, all these sorts of questions. There is a complete lack of transparency. And so um, we did an analysis of police force websites across England and Wales, and they revealed that only 14% provide a basic definition of what an out of court disposal is. Now, remember, these are sanctions applied by police. It's their responsibility to explain what they're doing. It's not for the CPS to do it, it's for the police to do it. And yet only 14% on the police force websites are providing a basic definition. We judged that the websites of 24 forces out of 43 require significant improvement because they have no basic information about out-of-court disposals. 
There was some good practice in openness, transparency, and accountability about out of court sanctions, but only in five, five police forces. Avon and Somerset, we thought, was doing really well in terms of, of the information that they provided about out of court disposals. Um, and our recommendation is that police must use their websites and social media to promote success and best practice around out of court disposals. And that way they will encourage understanding. If you're going to, we're moving to a new model that the government's introducing with two new statutory out of court disposals plus community resolutions. This is an opportunity to explain to the public what they are. If there's gonna be more use of these then you've got to carry the public with you. And, you know, police for, and to start that, police forces have got to make people aware of what they're doing and explain what they are. And there is a hell of a job for them to do to improve what they're doing at the moment in that respect. We also conducted um, an opinion survey of over 2,100 people. Um, this is a, a nationally representative survey of people in England and Wales, of adults. Um, and we asked them, first of all, if they could define the term out of court disposals. Um, we found that just less than a third could accurately define that term. Um, I mean, some people gave some definitions that were close, but were not really an accurate definition. Now, that's, that's clearly a concern, and it shows that there is some way to go to improve public understanding of these measures. Probably 80-90% of people understand what the term imprisonment means. Um, I would imagine that when you put community penalties, community orders to people, most people understand what that is. There should be similar levels of understanding in terms of out of court disposals and sanctions. Um, and that's not the case at the moment, which goes to the point about police websites and improving understanding. We then explained to people, gave them a short description of what out of court disposals are, and then asked a series of other questions. Two thirds support using out of court disposals for low level and first time offending. So there was good level of support when it was explained to them what out of court sanctions are. And there was also strong support for using diversion programs for vulnerable offenders. For example, people who are victims of domestic abuse, those at risk of suicide, people uh, with health problems, mental health problems, housing problems, and so on. There was, there was you know, real sort of public support for that, that an offender who has one or more of those issues perhaps should be dealt with by way of an out of court disposal, not necessarily being uh, dragged through the court, sent to prison and so on. We then went through some specific offences and we found good support um, for using out of court disposals for adults caught in possession uh, of, of cannabis. 45% backed that. 25% were against, and similar figures for shoplifting. Um, other offences, however, when you get offen offences going up the scale, um, you see uh, opinion is against using out of court disposals. So, you know, this is a rough guide. You know, I think surveys, you know, you have to take with an element of caution. Um, out of court disposals are not necessarily terms that people are familiar with but it gives you a rough level of where public opinion is at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, but most people feel that out of court disposals do not do enough to take into account the views of the public or of victims. Um, that was clear from our survey and there was absolutely overwhelming support for ensuring that when out of court disposals are issued or when they're going to be issued, that victims are consulted and properly informed. Obviously some crimes don't have a particular victim for drugs offense, but where there are victims, they absolutely should be consulted about that. Um, as I alluded to earlier, a large majority are against using out of court disposals for serious offenses, rape, sexual assault, serious assault, supplying drugs, uh, possession of class A drugs and burglary. There were some people who were in favour, but most are against. Um, but 
you know, these views uh, can shift. And uh, I would suggest that perhaps in terms of individual circumstances, if you had a, a first time offender um, for, you know, perhaps a young offender with particular vulnerabilities for uh, possession of a class A drug, you know, there's certainly nuances there. Certainly the public might prefer an out of court disposal, but in general, they don't want to see them used for serious offences. I think there's still a problem of perception in terms of out of court disposals, although the public are generally supportive for low level offending. 44% view out of court sanctions as a soft option. So even for first time low level offenders, they still see it as a soft option, it's too soft. So although they support it, you know, it's it, in their in their eyes, it's soft. In terms of what helps cut crime and reoffending, most people, 63%, believe prison helps to do that, but only a minority think cautions are effective, 38%. Um, so again, this is about perceptions of what people believe uh, works and so on. Um, we then asked people about um, options for reducing the backlog of cases in the criminal courts. And we put, you know, a series of, a series of possibilities. Um, and we found that, in fact, most support for reducing the court backlogs was increasing magistrate sentencing powers. Worth remembering, this survey was conducted in uh, around November time, I think October, November time. Um, so well before uh, Dominic Raab's announcement, but there was there was support, I think around two thirds for increasing magistrate sentencing powers. There was also support for increasing funding for the criminal justice system and also majority support for restricting jury trials so that you reserve jury trials for the most serious cases, but less serious cases could be tried by a panel headed by a judge. But less than half said police should impose more out of court disposals to reduce the backlog of cases in the criminal courts. That's still a decent level of support, but it's certainly not at the levels of those other um, options that, um, that I mentioned. So that was our, our survey. Go on to the next, thank you. So we've come up with 19 recommendations. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. As I said, you can read the report, read all the recommendations on the Crest Advisory website. Um, but a lot of them relate to getting better data, doing more research, uh, because you know, we found that our study was hampered by the lack of really good facts and figures on this and analysis. Um, I'm going to pick out some of the key recommendations. We believe the Home Office should commission analysis to compare reoffending rates and victim satisfaction levels between each type of out of court disposal and sanctions imposed by the and sanctions imposed by the courts. Now that's clearly not something that can be done in a couple of months. That is a major piece of work, but that is something that they really should do to see exactly what is working in terms of reoffending rates to comparing similar pools of offenders um, and to try and find out which is more effective. We think that police and crime commissioners should set up systems to track the use and effectiveness of out of court disposals and diversion schemes in their local area um, and improve coordination between police forces and providers of diversion services. We did a, an in-depth study, so-called deep dive into Thames Valley uh, police force area, and we found that there wasn't good enough coordination in some instances between the providers and the, and the police partners, and that because there was certainly room for improvement there, and that's an area where diversion is used uh, on a big scale, and and that and that's a worry. Some police officers not really aware of the diversion programs that they would be sending offenders onto. Um, so there needs to be better understanding, better join up. And that's really a job for police and crime commissioners to do. Um, we think the Ministry of Justice and the Home Office should set out a national framework of standards around the use of community resolutions. Um, again, these are non-statutory 
um, out of court disposals. There is going to be this new system coming in with with two statutory um, out of court sanctions, which will have conditions attached, but community resolutions will still be an option for police forces. These light touch disposals that don't lead to a criminal record and that they are the most popular disposal at the moment. But there needs to be some national, a national framework of standards around them. There's too much variation at the moment. Um, we also think that each police force must have an independent panel to scrutinize the use of out of court disposals in particular community resolutions. Some police forces do, but we, this needs to be a requirement for every police force. Next. Um, coming on to our second lot of recommendations. Again, I've just picked out uh, a few. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we think there should be a joint Home Office Ministry of Justice innovation fund for new tailored diversion programs. Um, that's to encourage local forces um, to set up these schemes. Um, my screen seems to have gone blank. Sure. Let me just go back on. Yeah, so a new Home Office Ministry of Justice Innovation Fund for new tailored diversion programs to encourage police and crime commissioners and police forces to set those schemes up. This could be a sort of match funding uh, model, something like that, but it needs upfront funding. So it needs something to put some sort of rocket boosters under it. As I mentioned earlier, we think the youth offending team model should be extended uh, to 18 to 25 year olds. Um, so that they can, their underlying problems can, can be properly addressed. Um, and in terms of transparency, police forces must explain on their websites what out of court disposals are, which ones they use and what crimes they use for. This is not a big piece of work. This is something that police forces could start to do now, could get in place pretty quickly. But they're using out of court disposals a lot they've got to tell the public what they're used for. When you go on most police force websites, there is no information about what will happen to people who uh, are caught for low level offending or what out of court disposals they use. And finally, strengthening the role of scrutiny panels, um, which oversee the use of out of court disposals and diversion programs. I think we've alluded to this, but um, their role certainly needs to be given a bit more, a bit more weight in each police force area. So those are the recommendations. Um, thank you very much um, for listening to that presentation. Uh, we're going to hear in a second from our three guest speakers um, and you can take part in the debate. I know a lot of you are already using the chat function. Um, uh, you'll see on your screen, you should have a chat button. Uh, you can just post your comments there. If you want to take part in the Q and A, you can tap ask a question, um, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, enter your question in the box, tap the send button and we'll try to respond to as many as we can. Um, I should say that this session is being recorded um, and it will be made available um, later on for people who miss it or if you want to watch certain bits again. So just be aware that uh, questions will be recorded. So if you don't want to use your name for some reason, um, then that's fine, just let us know or just post it anonymously. Um, and also you can uh, go on our Twitter account um, because we've got hopefully a debate going on there at Crest Advisory using the hashtag, hashtag OOCD and not forgetting our website www.crestadvisory.com where you can read our full report. So thanks very much. Um, I'm now going to introduce um, uh, the first of our speakers. Um, Jason Q is um, in the last few weeks of his long career with uh, the police service at Thames Valley Police. Um, he has had a, a hugely successful career uh, in the police service. He's currently a detective chief inspector and based in Thames Valley's violence reduction unit. Uh, Jason, Jason's focus is very much on diversion programs and drug diversion programs in particular, and he's now going to use his, his expertise as a consultant 
as a senior innovation uh, practitioner for justice innovation. So I'm going to hand over to Jason to give us his reflections on the report and uh, some other wider thoughts. Over to you, Jason. Thank you, Danny. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And before I start, I, I must just say um, I'm overwhelmed with the privilege that it is to be here on, on the panel with such brilliant people, um, uh, Peter and Avroyd, um, who, who obviously clearly led Thames Valley Police and much of the work that we're doing now is a legacy of his and, um, and Penny as well. And um, I'm, I'm really proud to be to be here. Um, my expertise is not through academia. It's by doing the job. Um, I'm very much a practitioner and I very much lean to those in academia to to help evidence what we're doing. Um, it, it's it, just to just to introduce um, the work, really, um, the, the Thames Valley Drug Diversion Scheme is it, it's a partnership approach. Um, the police are merely a gateway to diversion. The police, yes, hold that gateway to an out court disposal or a community resolution. The, the, the community resolution itself is the jewel in the crown of out court disposals and it's very very underused you can turn what was it, an incriminating encounter into a positive health outcome as look for many different offense types as long as the intervention is meaningful and is available so it's, it's the role of partnerships to be involved in out court disposals I, I, I won't tire of saying enough really the, the police are just a mere partner in this. We're just a gateway to getting people towards that intervention at, in a trauma-informed, effective way. Um, I, I really value the recommendations of this report. I think, um, yes, the MOJ and the Innovation Fund, I think working with um, the experts in the field, such as Revolving Doors, the Centre for Justice Innovation itself, who I uh, proudly work with, um, and, and other organisations such as Release Drugs, who provide, may provide a, a, an activist mindset towards drug policy, but clearly have a huge wealth of evidence to inform the design of any particular model. And I think policing shouldn't be afraid to step into that sphere and to work with the experts who really know their business. For a drug possession offence, what does society have? Yes, the state has a duty of care, but for, for possession of drugs, looking at the smoking cessation model where the evidence is clear that over 8 million people die every single year worldwide according to the World Health Organization from tobacco. 78,000 people a year in the UK die each year from tobacco but Public Health England have developed a hugely successful model in reducing that number and including public health. We in policing need to adopt that to work with those evidence bases. Now that's purely a health model, but clearly that can be attributed to drug possession too, because the state has a duty of care to reduce drug use and so on. So we should be much more mindful of what we're trying to achieve. Um, this isn't about um, uh, reducing demand so much. This is about the person underneath this. This is what we're trying to, you know, we're building one model that fits all and actually if you're trauma informed and realize this, a number of people have multiple complex needs and an outcome for one individual would be completely different for another. We need to be sensitive to this. And I can't emphasize enough the need for trauma informed training. Um, a police officer in one area will understand that uh, the person in front of them may well be using heroin and crack six or seven times a day, injecting into their neck. Uh, they may well be found in possession of their last rocker crack is being is being you know sent to police custody effective for that person absolutely not they need to go to a drug service or to re-engage half of all um, the 350,000 registered heroin and crack users are out of treatment at the moment we need to re you know re-look at that broaden the the, the engagement um, opportunities that diversion presents now that's solely for drugs but also the role of the community has a huge importance here. The violence reduction uh, units are a network of partnership experts from across the sector, uh, from education, right the way through to businesses in a social impact model, right the way through to, um, to uh, people with lived experience themselves and all need to be involved in this innovative uh, area of work. And just to finalise, um, the police aren't the only gateway. Um, uh, the Thames Valley Drug Diversion Scheme uh, incorporated the, the use, if you like, or the lending of the model to schools to preclude the need for exclusion. So students can now be diverted 
governed and overseen by the brilliant yachts and and to work um and you know to, to, to affect that diversion in order to preclude the need to exclude in the first place diversion is much more effective it's not just about criminal justice it's through throughout all uh, stakeholders so i'm very passionate about this area as you could probably tell um i'm i'm really proud to be here and um it's probably about time to pass on to somebody else to introduce themselves but thank you danny i'm really really pleased to be here thank you jason your your enthusiasm and your passion come across really clearly and thank you for helping um, us with with the report and, and the deep dive um, now i'm going to ask our next speaker uh, penelope gibbs um, to to give her reflections on the report and some wider comments penelope is director of the criminal justice campaign group transform justice which she's led for 10 years and she's also deputy chair of the standing committee for youth justice um, which is looking puzzled. I don't know whether. <laughs> and no longer, Danny. No now longer. National Appropriate Adult Network. Okay. Um, and you, you're a research associate at the University of Oxford. You previously worked for the Prison Reform Trust. But um, Penelope is an expert in this field and has got some, some really interesting and slightly different views, which I think will be worth hearing. So over to Penelope. Thanks very much, Danny. Um, and uh, I wouldn't call myself a research expert, just a sort of expert from having worked on it amongst other projects for the last two years for Transform Justice. So we've been funded by the Lloyds Bank Foundation to promote not out of court disposals, but diversion from prosecution, because what we're most concerned about is that a lot of cases go to court quite low level cases and the sanction, the most popular sanction in the magistrate's court is a fine. And we have huge doubts as to whether uh, a fine, well, it's definitely not rehabilitative, but whether it contributes as well to reducing reoffending as uh, many out of court disposals or other diversionary approaches. So I, I would slightly challenge the idea that we don't have stats about that. So the reoffending rate for um, a court, somebody who's received a court fine is 21% and a caution is 12%. Now I know that the people will be slightly different, but there will be a massive overlap between those who receive a fine in the magistrate's court and those who receive a caution. And way back, there was a piece of research which more directly, uh, which is referenced by the way in our briefing about the case for diversion, which actually took it as similar offenses and people committing them. And still the out of court option was more effective in terms of reducing offending than the court option. Um, as we can also see from the deferred prosecution work. So yes, we need more work on it, but I think the difference in the reoffending rate is so stark that it does suggest that out of court for the same kind of offence probably works better in terms of re reducing reoffending. And that's where I'd also kind of do a slight challenge of your excellent report, um, which is about what kind of out of court disposal so rob allen who has done lots of work for us which many of you will know did a report for us about diversion from prosecution which was called less is more and that is the evidence base that often less is more with people who commit crime so as we know the level of criminal sanction doesn't make a difference to reoffending it's the chance of being caught and something happening. And actually, those reoffending figures are based on the simple caution, which is what it is probably still most used uh, in terms of cautions by police forces at the moment. So a simple caution has no program attached. It's an admission of doing the offence. You, you, uh, you know, you're on the PNC. It can come up in a DBS check for certain offenses, et cetera. It's basically getting into trouble with the law. And there was a major study done led by Kevin Wong, which compared on a randomized trial, 
reoffending of simple caution, which remember has no program, is not tailored, and uh, the conditional caution with programs attached. And actually the reoffending rate was exactly the same for the two cohorts. So I would just, you know, kind of challenge the idea that every out of court approach needs a program. There is no evidence for that. The strongest evidence is that getting into trouble makes the difference. Now that doesn't mean to say that, I, that there isn't evidence that programs are appropriate for some people and necessary. But then I'd come to the evidence on deferred prosecution. So to me, it's the, the high end ones which may need the program or the people with intent, entrenched problems or whatever. And I'm absolutely sure that, you know, the program then can, can contribute to their moving on and not offending in the future. But I think it's horses for courses. And in the future, I think we need to be careful not to just spray around conditional cautions to every single person who gets arrested, because it will, it will eat up resources and it may not be necessary. So equally, a lot of people may be willing to take on a, volu on a voluntary basis a program. You know, so outcome 22 can be used for deferred prosecution, but it can also be used to refer somebody to a program. So all I'd say is we just need to be careful about the dosage, as it were, that we use on cautions and community resolutions. And the only other thing I would say is more, I'm a bit more downbeat than you about what happened during the pandemic. So I, I would love the use of uh, diversion to have really increased a lot. But our evidence, when we looked at home office outcomes up to March, 2021, so the pandemic year, is that actually the charging rate for a lot of low level crimes was exactly the same as it was the year before or very little different. And overall, it was the same as 2019. So it went up a bit in 2020, up to March 2020, but then actually it, it was very high in the pandemic, the charging rate. When you think about the fact that there was lockdown, there was a 10% reduction in uh, recorded crime, and there was pressure on the courts. Um, so I think what, what our evidence about pandemic policing says is that you've got a super tanker out there and it's, it's quite challenging when even in a pandemic, you can't get a radical change in the use of diversion. Um, so uh, that's all I want to say. I mean, we will put uh, material we've put up, we've uh, put forward in the chat, and I hope it helps. The messaging, we've got a messaging guide based on research about how everybody could message more effectively about this. And can I just say, great report. These are just a few challenges. End of. Thanks, Penelope. Really, really uh, great to hear your contribution. Thank you. Um, our final panelist is Peter Nehru, a distinguished academic at the Institute of Criminology at the University of Cambridge, co-chair of the Campbell Collaboration in Crime and Justice, and his research has included uh, studying the use of out-of-court di diversion programs. And before that, Peter had a long career in the police service, chief constable of Thames Valley, and then he led the National Policing Improvement Agency. So, Peter, over to you. Thanks, Danny. Um, it's certainly a good report. And it's certainly timely, um, given that we've got uh, you know, fairly significant changes to uh, out of court disposals uh, from the police crime and sentencing bill that are poised to come. Uh, but let, let just pick out, I'm just going to pick out half a dozen things out of your report. The first one, which is I was very pleased to hear that your stakeholders were keen to see more high quality research. My plea to them, given I look down the list of stakeholders, is 
it's fine to answer that to a, a report like this. It'd be great if they actually responded positively when we asked them to do the research, because there are always, if you really want high quality research on out of court disposals, you have to compare low level magistrate court charges with out of court disposals, as we did in Turning Point in Birmingham and Turning Point in London. I mean, Turning Point Birmingham, as far as I can tell from extensively searching the field is that was the first study ever to compare prosecution with out of court disposal and the out of court disposal is one hands down in terms of the comparison on reoffending rates and uh, and harm um, and by the way on victim satisfaction as well so unless we're prepared to to push the back push the boat on on research and ask those fundamental questions with the support of some of the people who tend to be very keen to see the research, uh, but not quite so keen to let it happen. We won't answer some of those questions. We have got a shed load of evidence in this area. So, you know, it's not as if we're lacking evidence. We can't necessarily answer every question. One of the questions we've, we, you know, really do need to do, pro to do the research on properly is the effectiveness, as Penelope said, the effectiveness of conditions because there are kind of three or four things that are critical to understand that. First of all is eligibility screening and getting that right. You know, which offenders and which offences go into which type of, uh, of, um, of, of disposal? By the way, disposal is a horrible word. Um, secondly, we, we need more research on, oh, no, more, more testing and more effective needs assessment because it's one thing to, to talk about tailoring, quite another to have a needs assessment that frontline cops can use effectively. It's not a straightforward thing. There are, there's some work that's being done to, to try and provide that sort of thing in a technological way, but it certainly needs training. And then tracking, um, you are absolutely right in the report that unless this process is properly tracked um, and you properly track reoffending, victim satisfaction, prevalence, frequency, harm, and time to reoffending. The survival time is also important. Two, year, two years, two years till, till reoffending, as opposed to six months, is a, is a significant gain and should not and one not to be ignored. You don't mention significantly in the report the issues of disproportionality, uh, which we in both in the Birmingham and London turning point, um, and my uh, colleague and PhD student Katie Harbour's on this uh, webinar, who's leading the London one. We've demonstrated the importance of paying attention to the admission of guilt and its relationship with disproportionality and the potential to get very significantly better outcomes for, for those from black, particularly black communities. You, I, don't think you, you wrote, I don't think you do enough on gender in this, but I'm absolutely clear that you're right on the transitions to adulthood and the need to, the need to extend some of, the, some of the provisions that apply to those under 18 to those over 18. And just to kind of finish up why this is such an important and timely report, I mean, we've had ever since um, <laughs> the enormously inimitable grayling kicked off uh, criminal justice reforms to out of court disposals. We've had a very long and prolonged period of uncertainty about what the future framework looks like that's about to be settled. Um, I have to say, for those that are feeling optimistic, try reading clauses 97 to 105 of the Police Crime and Sentencing Bill and you'll lose all hope. Uh, they don't bear a lot of relationship to the evidence. I've absolutely no idea how the pantomime horse in that bill came out of the research and the evidence that was put into the Ministry of Justice, but we'll obviously the, you know, the criminal justice system will have to work with what it gets. Uh, and that means that your report is particularly timely encouraging uh, the, the development of the, you know, various consistent elements of that uh, and, making, and making it clear that each element of it conditions the application of community and diversionary cautions, as well as the continued use of community resolutions and deferred prosecution. All, all, of, all of that needs to be properly and effectively researched in the round, which is quite a considerable challenge for the system. I'll stop there. Peter, that's... that's... Really interesting. Thank you very much for, for your contribution. Um, I'm going to pick up on some questions now in the Q&A. As I said, I would encourage people to, to ask questions in the Q&A. And in fact, the first one is I'm going to ask Peter to answer it. It's a question from Russell Webster. Russell says, it is clear that out-of-court disposals like those delivered by Checkpoint in Durham can be effective. 
But Russell says, I'm a bit concerned about transparency and accountability. Looking at Checkpoint, the intervention is intensive, up to four months, up to five conditions. What about checks and balances and accountability for issues such as racial disparity? Um, since you mentioned that, Peter, perhaps you, you want to pick up on that? Well, Checkpoint was a, uh, like Turning Point, was a deferred prosecution scheme. Um, the, the, the slight difference in the model of Checkpoint was, was, well, was twofold. Firstly, instead of police officers setting the conditions and doing the needs assessment, uh, the uh, Durham used uh, navigators, largely with a probation background. And the second thing that was tested in Checkpoint was the, was the potential to use uh, an algorithmic triage to determine who, who was eligible for the uh, for the condition. Um, as to the transparency of the of, of the conditions, actually, I think they're probably pretty transparently out there, um, in the sense that Durham Durham certainly has a um, a, a local um, oversight oversight committee, and then it's not dissimilar from the other conditions. Uh, with a deferred prosecution model, where there's no uh, requirement to admit guilt. The there's two tests: the public interest test and the sufficiency of evidence test. Uh, our evidence from certainly from the two turning point um, trials. I can't remember the evidence out of checkpoint on on disproportionality, but the evidence from the turning point trials is there's a significant improvement um, in in terms of disproportionality uh, from the from a deferred prosecution where there's no admission of guilt. Um, and, that, and that's you know that's, we've got a replicated trial for that. So. And we've got Katie, Katie Harbour coming up on your um, on your chat as well with some of the some of the information on that. Thank, thank, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm just going to go to the next question is from Chris Bath, um, and this might be one for for Jason. Chris says, have we sufficiently interrogated the assumption that responsibility for out of court disposals should sit with police? What would be the impact of the custody process during investigation, including the administration of out of court disposals was administered by justice, e.g. magistrate led rather than police? Um, Jason, thoughts on that? It's a good, a really good question. Um, from my experience of the diversion scheme, we undertook a, a, a regular training program, if you like, or a training input to the Magistrates Association. But the lay magistrates' numbers are really high. They're within the um, East Berkshire, I think there were over 200 alone. So reaching that audience within the, the, the magisterial um, uh, cohort is quite large, quite, quite in-depth um, task. The, um, the decision-making, I think, for out-court disposals are Ultimately, these are community resolutions or community, I, I agree with Peter's comment about disposals being a horrible word, um, it, it is that, it's, where is the role of the community in this decision making? And one of the recommendations within the report was that the yacht um, mechanism should be increased by age up to 25, and I fully support that because there's an existing ground of good practice within the yachts in order to support that more regular decision making. But you will get variances, you will have um, uh, geographical um, differences um, and also each case should be made on its own merit so although that answer is a little woolly because the question is quite quite a, you know very arguably a, a good one but very wide um, I, I do believe there's more to this okay uh, Jason thank, thank you very much um, I mean one of the I think one of the issues uh, that we wanted to discuss is about this idea of, of using youth offending teams as a model, perhaps for extending um, to, to to people aged 18 to 25. And I just wondered whether Penelope, you have any thoughts about that, about whether you've seen in youth offending teams compared with probation teams, whether they would be better equipped, that kind of model would be better um, better for for young young adults, and particularly in terms of uh, out of court sanctions. Whether you had any thoughts about that, Penelope? I think Penelope is. Uh, I think Penelope might have frozen there. Um, I'm not hearing her. But um, Jason, Jason, what 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 do you think about that? Do you think 
do you think we should have a sort of youth offending style model for young adults? Yeah, I do. I, I don't think it should stop there either. I think the, the model is, is proven to be, you know, very effective and it's the best in existence at the moment, I believe, in, into, in, into basically accessing the range, the toolbox of interventions. And I think what we want, what we want to try and aspire to is, you know, pre-arrest, not just pre-court. So the role of the yacht in that process or the youth justice uh, units or uh, services are, are, are really paramount. I think um, there are some really good examples, I think, emerging already of up to 25. Um, but certainly we, we should aspire to be even older than that, where the evidence um, uh, points towards. Just a bit of caution, Danny, with the, the, the ideas of engaging uh, so many different players in this field. Um, one of the things that we think is probably quite important in turning point was the speed between uh, between arrest and getting people straight into the scheme. So we set a goal of no more than 48 hours between initial decision and custody and the, and the contract being set. Um, certainly, if you're going to try and, in, for example, involve involved magistrates uh, in that process, uh, you, can, you can forget that kind of time scale uh, because inevitably you're going to have to have paperwork to do that and that's going to take time. Um, and and furthermore, the evidence of the systematic review that Petrosino and others did is that the more formal processing that's involved in the system, the more there'll be a backfire. Uh, so I'd, I'd be nervous about engaging the full, I mean, the, the youth, youth offending team was, was created because there is a very different framework for, for young offenders prior to 18. Um, if you're gonna do something like that for, the, for, the, for, for offenders over 18, you, you don't want to just adopt a youth offending team. There are different considerations. And above all, you want to emphasise getting things done quickly, um, and trying to get and trying to get people into the contract and into uh, the process as fast as possible. Thanks, Peter. Um, I just want to come to to a question from Anna Baker, um, who runs the Checkpoint Division in North Wales, um, and since. They started in December 2019. She says her ongoing battle is with supporting adults in addiction who will invariably continue to offend to fund their needs. Uh, she says, this is Anna Baker says, reoffending will put them in breach of their checkpoint contract and we work under deferred prosecution. So I would like to see us review how we support people who reoffend during the contract interested to hear how other diversion programs which operate under deferred prosecution operate with such cases i mean that that is the that is one of the issues here is, you know you can have a scheme that, that that is more tailored to someone's needs and their problems in terms of addiction but there has to be a contract or a, a potential sanction if they don't abide by the conditions and if it's deferred prosecution um you end up going to court. Is there any system or any way around that? Perhaps, Penelope, since you sort of um, missed out on that that last round of questions, is that is that something that you? I mean, th this is a you know one of the big problems, isn't it? A lot of the people who are continually sort of in you know you know coming into trouble with the police and so on have underlying addiction problems that are very hard to tackle. Any thoughts on that, Penelope? I mean, I, I think it's absolutely essential to tackle them because, you know, the, the resolution of crime and uh, reducing reoffending is is outside the criminal justice system. So, you know, we're not we're just not going to resolve, uh, you know, a lot of crime without dealing with addiction problems or housing problems or education problems or whatever. And very few uh, options that say the magistrates court use have that kind of uh, rehabilitative, you know, option there. So yes, absolutely, we have to try and we have to try and try again. I think one of the things about out of court disposals is there are huge restrictions on people using them more than once. And um, actually that, that's not evidence-based. Desistance is a journey with ups and downs. So we should, there should be more ability to use out of court disposals for somebody who's perhaps tried and failed once or twice, because 
you know, the evidence is that third or fourth time it might work. What are the rules about that, Jason, in your experience about repeat offenders, as it were, people who, um, you know, they try one drug diversion program and then they come again. What, what, what's, what guidelines are operating in, in Thames Valley in regards to that? So there's a few, I've got three points here and I'm going to try and remember them. The first, the first thing is that um, Peter's point about the speed of diversion is absolutely necessary. The Thames Valley scheme is within 24 hours or very, the very least the day after. So as soon as that community resolution or the diversion has been decided upon on the street, the next person that uh, individual will hear from is the drug service. Over to the experts. The police have just applied that gateway theory. So this, the, the second, second point here, and Anna's question is absolutely spot on because this is where overlapping ideologies, overlapping government strategies, um, merge into trying to solve, you know, a wicked problem under one policy. So addiction is complex. Um, uh, one person's addiction or the trauma that caused the addiction or led to the addiction will be completely different to another's. Um, unless you tackle the trauma, you're not going to tackle the addiction. Um, we need to uh, understand, again, this is a trauma-informed model, that um, that different policies and, 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 the, and the route to a true public health approach to tackling drugs is absolutely necessary. So nowhere, for instance, was there mentioned in the government's recent 10 year um, drug strategy um, uh, uh, was any aspiration around a heroin assisted treatment. Now, heroin assisted treatment as trialed in Cleveland has reduced for a cohort of 12 people um, uh, 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 acquisitive crime from 887 crimes within three months down to 10. So that's a true public health model to looking at what addiction really means, but that's nothing to do with alcohol disposals or diversion. That's a health model, but it's not, in, not available everywhere. So within the areas that uh, the checkpoint uh, light scheme where Anna works is, you know, would there be heroin assisted treatment to perhaps divert that individual to that scheme if that was what that person needed? So it's, it's a very wicked problem and it requires, it requires a very complex answer. Um, police here, and I reiterate, aren't the experts. We're just the gateway. Um, Sorry, Danny, can I come in on that one just to, just to pick up the other side? So one of the things we were very conscious of when we were testing deferred prosecution in Birmingham is this, this, there is a tight balance here. Um, for the scheme, for, the, for a deferred prosecution scheme to be perceived to be legitimate, uh, by the public, there must there must be a uh, a clear a, a clear response to breach, um, and I, I think there's with the with drug with drug addicted offenders there's a there is a difference here between breach by taking drugs and breach by committing other offences. So, for example, a drug addicted offender who's on a program who who is who takes who takes drugs is is one thing. One who then commits a street robbery. Uh, and creates another vic another uh, dis you know distinct personal victim is quite another. Uh, the one definitely has to be breached. The other one that could be part of the, the of, of the process, and you could pick up some of the ideas around Operation Hope, which is an American model, uh, in which they tested an escalating uh, version of responses to breach, finally finishing up with going into the formal process. And we've got Project Adder, which is and the trouble is there's so many bloody projects floating around in this but we have project adder which is a has got quite a lot of funding behind it and and one of my students is currently researching it if we can overcome the incredible reluctance of the health service to give to give any information whatsoever to the criminal justice system for which to help them treat a, a problem uh, then it is quite possible that 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 might be where we can develop some of the ideas to overcome this particular area but we'll see Thank, thank, thanks very much. I mean, this kind of leads on a little bit in terms of um, sanctions and the need for a sanction if you've got an out-of-court disposal and you've got conditions. Um, to a question from Katie Harbour, how do we deconflict political desire to be hard on crime and thus favour prosecution and the evidence base that prosecution for low-level offending is not effective, which is what Penelope was uh, talking about earlier? Public will have views on this and we need to convince them, not just ourselves. Penelope, I think that's one for you to tackle. Um, I mean, I, we 
we do need to convince the public. And I think the slightly confused media messaging that came out the other day when Sadiq Khan's, you know, the mayor of London's approach to diversion of drugs offences uh, shows that there isn't a clear line that is taken about why uh, diversion is good. But, but actually, I think there's fertile ground out there. Our own polling shows that the public are very supportive of diverting uh, people from court. They're hearing about the backlogs, the delays. And um, in our research, people wanting their day in court what was a pretty low priority. Now they do want people to be punished. And so what I think we need to do is frame diversion in a sense which gets people to understand that it isn't soft, that it's not letting people off the hook and that it's effective. So I think Nina has done a link to our messaging guide. And that's what I would say, not just to try and hard to, to frame it in this effective sense, but also we need to just speak a bit louder about it, more proactively about it. So what tends to happen is the, the press get hold of a number, you know, a number like the use of out of court disposals for very serious offenses, which cannot look in, in some senses kind of high. And they put it out there and the government then responds or the NPCC, we need to be a bit more on the front foot about it and do a bit more proactive messaging. And with those serious offences, and I would come back to your research as well, my understanding is it's often where the alleged victim absolutely refuses to cooperate with the police. So the victim has been consulted, but they say, no way, Jose, am I going to cooperate? So frequently the use of an ad court disposal for a very serious offence is as opposed to no further action, NFA. And again, I think we need to um, communicate that those are the kind of circumstances that it might be used for very relatively serious offences. So yes, it's absolutely critical that people understand what it is. And I would say the public said to us that they understood better if you say resolve crime without going to court and absolutely don't use the out of court disposal word, but they're not that keen on diversion either. But yeah, let's all get on the front foot, including police forces, police and crime commissioners, everybody. There's a real messaging challenge there, isn't, isn't there, Jason? Um, how can we, if we want to increase the use of these out of court disposals, and it is a horrible word, disposal, um, Jason, how can we how can how can we get the messaging better and frame it as you know as 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 Penelope says? I think um, the the role of the VIUs is really crucial here. Um, the the VIUs being a partnership of partnerships, you know, in, including the community uh, themselves, are, are a perfect vehicle to depoliticizing the most hotly debated to topics such as um, such as drugs, for, as an example. Um, you, I, I think. Um, you know, many, many politicians privately will, will think one thing and practice another. And I think those party lines are idealistic in, in many cases. And as, as a partnership of police, health and academia, we need to challenge that status quo, um, destigmatizing uh, policy as we go along. That's not being an activist, it's not being a rebel, um, it's being evidence-based and, and carefully, um, you know, carefully applying that. Uh, you know that that, that process um, as just one example in Thames Valley um, I, I reviewed a drug related death on behalf of the MP for Windsor Maidenhead um, I met with her relayed the evidence and after two out two hours um, we had a positive um, communication around um, a new policy leading to drug diversion uh, that MP was the um, was the Prime Minister at the time uh, and she was hugely compassionate so even the most visible um, leaders uh, with one um, uh, position against drugs may well have a different view uh, when you know when you have that interaction with them. And I think you know, change can be can be can occur anywhere, just as that example uh, proved. Jason, I'd be interested in your thoughts, um, 
Peter talked about it earlier, we're moving to this new system, this uh, of uh, out of court disposals when there's going to be two types of caution, basically, that both have conditions attached. So there will no longer be a caution without any conditions. Uh, and the uh, penalty for not adhering to the conditions will be with one type of caution will be a fine and the other um, would be a, a potential prosecution. Um, do you think that this is a system that can work better than the system that we have at the moment? If the right people are involved in designing it, then yes, um, we really do have to be aware of social inequality. Um, someone at Royal Ascot being found with a bag of cocaine receiving a fine will be able to afford that much more easily than someone living on cardboard in Windsor. Um, we need to really be careful about how we apply uh, disposals, um, horribly as they are, um, but these resolutions um, need to be trauma informed. Um, the community resolution really is, is a jewel in the crown, requires no arrest, no interview, nor admission. Um, and they are very, very underused. And I think their expansion is really needed. So um, a punitive response to a health based crime is just not effective. It's just not evidenced uh, to be effective either. But we're sort of moving away from from Penelope's idea, which is that it's actually about being caught. Um, that, that, that is most effective, which what she was suggesting is that, that there's evidence that whether you're given a caution with conditions or you're given a straight caution, there's not much difference in reoffending rates. We're moving towards a system whereby there are, you know, conditions or sanctions attached with both types of, of caution. Penelope, are you worried that this is the sort of the wrong approach that, that we're going down, that we're heading towards? I am worried about it, and I'm particularly worried about the abolition of the simple caution because it 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 was incredibly useful in certain circumstances, and I I just hope that people will re replace you know police officers will say oh this person who I would have given a simple caution to, I'll instead uh, give a community resolution as opposed to as I would see it up tariffing people to a conditional caution, which they may or may not need. I mean, maybe they do and that's fine, but yeah, I think the abolition of the simple caution and the other concern I have is that conditional cautions require more paperwork and bureaucracy on the police side. And we've already done research with police officers about that. And they feel that that is a barrier to using uh, out of court disposals in general. I'm not saying there isn't a place for conditional cautions, but they should absolutely, the threshold for them should be an offence which would otherwise be prosecuted rather than something which maybe would be at the lower level of the simple caution in the old days. So I, I think there needs to be a real push in terms of training for the police and also just getting hearts and minds of the police as well as to how they can use this new scheme. Danny, just to add to, uh, to that, it is, it is kind of curiously um, ironic that in the process of uh, the, the bill going through, um, we, appear to, we appear to be abandoning fixed penalty notices just at the moment where fixed penalty notices are really rather in the news. I mean, there probably should be a few for a garden party. Um, and we appear to be abandoning it without actually having necessarily learnt the lessons of what actually has happened over the pandemic. I mean, you've started the thing with a pandemic, but actually one of the lessons we had through the, the pandemic uh, was, the, was the fact that we use fixed penalty notices as opposed to any other mechanism as the primary means of street enforcement. And we know that it actually had some downsides. Um, Sarah, Sarah Grace's research on fixed penalty notices showed some problems uh, with disproportionality with fixed penalty notices. Uh, one of my students has been, has been looking at the COVID um, uh, enforcement in the Met, very timely, obviously. Uh, but, the, but, the, but there are some real lessons out of that that ought to be drawn into this. And I, I also, I, I just wonder what the code of practice that's gonna come out of the bill is gonna look like and how it's going to give a kind of common sense picture which any, I mean, how on earth do you tell a victim why somebody's been given a diversionary as opposed to a community caution? 
on the basis of the of, of the legislation i mean the, presumably there'll be some better guidance in the code of practice but it does look like a fairly problematic bit of um bit of bit of communication it, it is extraordinary actually because this sort of debate about the future of out of court disposals has been going on i think for about eight or nine years um you look back at the consultation 2014 2014 danny i remember it well because i was involved in that <laughs> indeed i was also the, the the instigator i was the inventor of the conditional caution and we never bothered to sit down and work out why that one didn't work either um and i mean the principal reason actually back to penelope's comment the principal reason it didn't work was because the crown prosecution service insisted on a full file and no police officer in their right mind wanted to do a full file for an offence they could get a simple file for for a prosecution and it, it ended up with just criminal damage and there's a real danger that this will end up being a minority sport not fulfilling the ambitions as i mean we were, we were trying to get more cases dealt with in 2002 by conditional cautioning and the process of creating barriers and obstacles in the form of increased paperwork knocked it out and nobody tracked it nobody paid attention until it become too late um and i think there's some real lessons from that past that could happen again you 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 mean that there'll be so much bureaucracy associated with this new system that um the, the police won't do it or that the, the, the cps will just rather prosecute is that what you mean no no frontline cops would rather put a put a put a prosecution file in than than, than go to go to all the extra lengths of trying to satisfy the bureaucracy of a, of a diversionary community caution. The more hoops and looking at the legislation, the legislation appears to appear to have to have um, more hoops than a, ga a game of, uh, of croquet uh, and a real danger that um, that the, you know, the appetite actually will be for community resolutions, cheap, cheap and cheerful, just get them out the way. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, that there's a real possibility that that ends up back where we ended up um, some while back, which is devaluing the whole process of out of court disposals by seeing it as an easy way of getting rid of a case and that's that kind of stuff thing is where you you end up with tales in the mail and the telegraph and, and we go back round a cycle that we've been around several times which led to the 2014 um, research it was a 2011 piece of work by policy exchange at the beginning of the Cameron government that triggered what became 2014 and what we've ended up with now but it's been a long process where nobody's actually sat down and gone to, you know, back to basic principles about what are we trying to achieve here, which is reduced reoffending and preventing crime. Jason, what can what can we do about that? This legislation is going through Parliament at the moment. You know, this is a moment. You know, police forces have got to make sure this system works, as Peter says. We don't just want to go back to that situation where the default position is is light touch disposal with no criminal record hardly any re rehabilitative conditions attached because police can't be bothered to go through all those hoops yeah i think it's just continuing the work of the, the experts get you know the work that, that you know that the, the criminal justice um charity sector are, are working hard to deliver you know just innovation are working hard with home office partners on this um the revolving doors the, exactly the same you need to look at the evidence base listen to Penelope, listen to the evidence and the ex vast experience of Peter to, to design a most effective and simple process for cops on the street to get the best outcome for that individual. Um, and not forgetting it's about the individual here. The gateway is just, just one thing. Oversimplifying it, apart really. Um, there's a specific question about the use of out of court disposals for um, people who are victims of modern slavery uh, offences. I don't know if um, any of you have got, if Peter's nodding, whether you've got a, um, a thought about that. The, the, sorry, the question is, how can we start to use out of court disposals more effectively with people who are experiencing exploitation involved in county lines? Should young people not receive an out of court disposal as they may have a defence in court under Section 45 of the Modern Slavery Act. That's from Jenna Palmer. So I might be able to provide some sort of response to that. Um, it's actually a piece of work that we've, we've that Rand um, and myself and one or two others have got um, a funding for, which is, a, which is a piece of work looking at the use of out of court disposals with, the, with vulnerable, vulnerable offenders. 
um, vulnerable for a variety of reasons, including mental health, for example. And we're in the first stages of that process of going out and, uh, and finding out what's actually being done. And that's one of the deficits is you know, building a new system of, um, of um, cautioning and diversion without really doing the, the detailed work about what exactly is out on the ground. So we're doing that first piece of work followed by um, a, 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 a third stage, which um, is about producing some better guidance, which hopefully will will inform the the code of practice by the end of at the end of this year. Because I, I have sympathy with this particular question. Um, it's really important that there is a provision which allows a degree of flexibility, where it's quite apparent that the biggest issue is the vulnerability of of the offender to exploitation. Um, and just to pick up as a point that. Anna Taylor's raised on the chat about what well, is it all of, you know is it is it just about the cops looking for a convenient way to resolve the case well I'm afraid Anna it is sometimes um, but one of the things that you have to do across policing is to explain to frontline cops and to custody officers and those handling cases you know what what um, cautioning and diversion is about and why it might work and why it might be a beneficial approach to prevention and I don't think the police service has always been good at doing that. Okay, we, we're entering the last few minutes now, and I want to sort of just wrap up on, on a positive note, if possible. Um, Jason, you're, you're a positive guy, passionate, full of enthusiasm. Um, give us some optimism that in five years' time, if we revisit this subject, we'll be in a better place, there'll be greater consistency, um, there'll be clearer guidelines, there'll be some research that's been done uh, around effectiveness and re-offending rates so that will be, you know, the best sorts of schemes and diversion uh, practices will, will be in use more widely and, and police websites will actually tell us what the forces are doing. <laughs> give, us, give us some hope. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think there's much to be cheery about, to be honest. I think, you know, we've seen um, the Thames Valley Diversions scheme um, uh, developed as a result of looking at what was happening in Avon and Somerset, you know, looking at their evidence base evolving. Uh, Durham's checkpoint is, you know, pioneering, but, you know, the Turning Point programme in West Midlands really does underpin, you know, vast amounts of positive evidence within there to create change. And now we've seen, you know, more diversion schemes pop up in the last year than, than you know, than ever, I think. So um, there's lots to be proud of, lots to be excited about. I think um, the VIUs here are, are crucial. I think the violence reduction units, their funding models, particularly if they win, I think we're going to hear in the next week or so, uh, multi-year funding will really uh, uh, accelerate uh, innovation, but also out-of-court disposals and diversion um, and, and help fund those interventions. As long as quality interventions are out there, we'll see many more schemes develop um, to look at you know, a, a wider a variety of previous offence types. And also politics is changing, isn't it? Uh, no, it's all can good. I, can I just... Yes, can Penelope, I was going to come to you. Can we give us an array of sunshine, Penelope. Oh, I think there's a massive ray of sunshine. The enthusiasm of police forces who we're working with across the country to use more effective diversion and actually rank and file police officers. So we're doing these surveys of... Uh, individual police forces and the majority of police officers want to use out of court you know want to use diversion more and here can I give an absolute shout out to the Surrey force Surrey police force is an absolute stellar lead in using diversion and we will we all need to try and learn from them and they've been there for years it is possible Peter? Well, the big shining light is the UK is currently leading the world on the research. Um, it used to be the Americans, it most definitely is the UK at the moment. Um, the legislation actually, I mean, the code of practice could be absolutely key. If the code of practice can, can support, could be supported by the evidence, then that we've got some really important reports. This the second, the replication of turning point that uh, Katie's working on at the moment, um, that's due very shortly and in terms of an interim report, we might have some of some real world beating evidence. And if we use it um, five years time, we could get to where your report is indicating, but we do need to use it. 
Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Put me back on screen. Sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to our panelists, um, Penelope, Peter, and Jason. Thank you to everyone who's attended and taken part and asked questions and taken part in the chat. Um, really lively discussion. Thanks very much. I'd also like to thank uh, people behind the scenes here at Crest have made this possible and done a lot of work um, over the past year. Um, Anthony Broxton for arranging for arranging this. Ellen Kirk, uh, Deline Adams, uh, who's done some fantastic work for us at Crest, and James Stott, um, who has really played a stellar role in leading this research. So thank thank you to thank them. Um, and if you want to read the report. Um, and any comments, then go on our website and um, www.crestadvisory.com. Thank you very much. Stop